This morning I'm being joined by Barry Caslin. Uh, Barry is an energy and rural development specialist with Chagas, and Barry will be helping with uh, questions later on uh, on the webinar. Good morning, Barry. Morning, Tom. Good to be here. Good. Um, and we're delighted to be joined this morning by another Chagas colleague, JJ Lenehan. JJ is the buildings officer with Chagas, based at our Beef Research Centre, Grange, County Meath. And JJ, you're very welcome as well to this morning's webinar. One of the targets for agriculture in the Climate Action Plan of 2023 is to produce up to one terawatt hour uh, of energy uh, through biomethane by 2025 and up to 5.7 terawatt hours of uh, energy by 2030. Uh, and the Climate Action Plan also indicates a target of the construction of uh, 20 anaerobic digestion um, facilities by 2025 and up to 200 anaerobic digestion plants by 2030. And the title ad of our webinar this morning is uh, Biomethane, an Opportunity for Ireland. And I suppose, JJ, my, 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 quest, my initial question to you before your presentation is, how big of a, a, an ambition uh, is, are, are the targets in relation to uh, biomethane production from agriculture? And, 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 you know, what, what is the scale of the opportunity that um, is there for Irish agriculture? Uh, I think the, 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 the potential is there to produce uh, the targets, but uh, they are initially, uh, to get the industry up and running, uh, policy will have to be put in place. Uh, and, you know, take the example of Denmark, where, where they have uh, a, a well-developed industry, but it's over a 30-year period. So I think uh, while um, the targets uh, are good and are challenging, they can be achieved if, pol if correct policies are put in place. Okay, okay, very good. Well, I'm sure you'll probably develop some of those points during your presentation. So I'll, I'll ask you now, um, JJ, to share your screen and commence your presentation. As you're doing that, I'll just remind our uh, audience this morning, uh, if you have questions that you'd like to put to JJ, uh, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, I'd advise you not to use the chat function because that function has been uh, disabled or also the raise your hand function, that, that function is also disabled. So if you want to engage with JJ, please uh, type your answers using the Q or the questions using your Q&A function and uh, after, after uh, JJ's presentation, then Barry and I will, will, um, will pose uh, as many of your questions as possible to JJ. So JJ, over to you. Okay, you can see my screen there? Yes. Everything is clear. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start off um, with uh, talking about, uh, if I can get that now to just work. Sorry. I'm going to start to talking about just energy in general in Ireland and where uh, gas sits and where renewable targets uh, are. And if just a bit of, of uh, its history now, but we had a renewable target for 2020 uh, of 16%. Europe had a 20% target, Ireland had 16%. And that was split into the different categories of energy there as outlined, 40% electricity, 12% heat, 10% transport. And in terms of the results, uh, we failed on all the targets. We got 12 out of the 16 and uh, electricity was 36.5 out of 40. Heat was well below the target and transport uh, was about just under, over 1%. But the transport was basically catered for by the government telling oil companies to uh, put X amount of biodiesel or, uh, into uh, their diesels and X amount of bioethanol into their petrols. Uh, gas, this is SEAI figures, and it shows oil is the big beast in terms of our energy, but natural gas, which is which is methane, uh, is the, uh, the second biggest component of our industry. And where we stand in, uh, where gas stands in European terms, uh, natural gas is about 25% of European energy uh, uh, demand. In, 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 in Ireland, again, SEAI figures show the, um, the natural gas usage as, or the natural gas share for energy going from 22.1 up to 31.3 in 2019. And it is still 
around that level. So we are above the European average in terms of our use of uh, uh, methane, natural gas. And, you know, there's a lot of talk or you hear talk about hydrogen as the renewable, uh, as, 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 as a renewable gas. Uh, you know, biomethane is a renewable gas uh, which can replace the gas that's currently used and where that there is already the infrastructure in place. So, you know, in terms of uh, how quick you can go to market, biomethane would definitely be uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the gas of choice. And just in terms, there's a lot of move towards electrifying our energy use. And OK, there will be uh, demand for electricity for electric cars. Uh, but electricity is 20% of our total energy, heat's 40 and transport uh, is uh, 40%. Renewable electricity, yes, wind and solar are very important, but when you don't have uh, the wind blowing, you don't have uh, electricity. And when the sun is not, sh or when well, the, the solar panels only react, uh, you don't have a solar panel producing electricity at nighttime. And uh, you can see there, Air grid dashboard has a, has a, a, a continuous daily uh, detail of where our energy, where electricity is coming from, and you can see uh, that situation there, where when the wind is not blowing, it's contributing uh, uh, very little to the electricity uh, uh, demand, and uh, the backup uh, is gas. And you can see there a typical breakdown of fuels used for electricity. Gas uh, averages about forty percent. Uh, we even have coal still in the system, so anybody buying an electric car needs to keep that in mind that uh, uh, some of that electricity may well be coming from from uh, from coal. AD, just talking a bit about AD, uh, uh, it's basically a process where you uh, uh, have a, a sealed vessel, anaerobic conditions, and microorganisms break down biodegradable material to produce biogas, which is predominantly methane and carbon dioxide. And uh, what you do with the biogas, uh, with a combined heat and power plant, you can you produce electricity and heat, but if you clean it up and remove the carbon dioxide, uh, you produce biomethane and that can be used for fuel or go into the gas grid and be used by any gas customer. And that's the way the industry is developing uh, in uh, the UK and in, in Europe. In terms of uh, feedstocks, Slurry, manure, slurry and manures can be used, food waste can be used, but the interesting one is uh, crops and where the big resource potentially is, uh, is from crop-based feedstocks. And in Ireland, the crop of choice would be grass. Uh, the other output from your, from your digester is digestate, uh, and that is a potent fertilizer. Uh, um, the, the European Biogas Association has just produced a report on uh, the um, uh, looking at the whole system's benefits of biomethane. With solar panels or, or uh, wind turbines, you will have renewable energy, uh, uh, but there are co-benefits with uh, biomethane in terms of you can produce uh, CO2, which uh, is a product in demand uh, industrially. Uh, you can process organic wastes and you have a fertilizer source. So there are additional benefits to having your renewable energy from, um, from biomethane. Uh, SEAI uh, did a study in 2017. Uh, they were updating their uh, their renewable energy uh, feed uh, renewable energy opportunities in Ireland. And um, they hadn't included grass at that stage. Chagas, uh, Porico Kiley, uh, had a good bit of work done on looking at other opportunities for grass and uh, energy from bio uh, gas biomethane was one one opportunity. Uh, UCC uh, Jerry Murphy uh, was working uh, also on the area and indeed Hillsborough uh, had uh, already installed a biogas plant at that stage. Uh, we we encouraged them to look at grass and they uh, undertook that study. And basically the output of that was that 25% um, uh, of our natural gas could come from um, biomethane. And uh, if you look at the, the, the chart there, you will see that waste-based AD uh, will get us about, you know, just around 5%. 
uh, but uh, to really get uh, uh, the the uh, the um, per quantity of gas, uh, you need to put in uh, uh, forage-based uh, feedstocks. And the reason being, we're a small country. We only have four million people. We only produce so much uh, sewage sludges and food waste. So the big opportunity there uh, w- 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 was seen as um, as forage crops. And if we look at some uh, research from uh, Germany, we see that if we're looking at using land for energy crops, uh, you can see that grass silage are for uh, biomethane, the output per hectare is uh, uh, substantially higher than biodiesel uh, from oilseed rape or bioethanol from wheat. And again, grassland is our big resource in Ireland in terms of agricultural land use. Uh, 81% grassland, 11% uh, rough grazing, and only 8% arable, which would be not typical in Europe. And producing grass. Uh, our, our Grass 10 program in Chagas shows that, you know, we can produce and utilise 10 tonnes of uh, dry, uh, dry matter per hectare, uh, and the average production is way, way below that. And, you know, there's a typical uh, field very close to Grange where we would be producing 10, 12 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. And because of the land management, uh, there's a crop of hay taken off that land uh, in July and the bales are still there in September. Uh, you know, there's no incentive, obviously, to grow more grass because the the, the operator is, is content with uh, having a low stocking rate and uh, the financial incentive perhaps is not there to to increase it, but there's a lot of land like that around the country. So five tons a hectare uh, dry matter output versus twelve, and every year that that twelve that that balance or that seven tons of dry matter is lost, it's lost uh, forever. Talk a bit about the Grange plant, a uh, fairly conventional uh, type of plant, uh, concrete tanks, fifteen hundred cubic meter digestion vessel. Uh, we will premix the liquid and solid feedstocks, the, the forages and the slurry, and that's important with uh, materials like grass because it, it's difficult to mix within the tank. Whereas you will find uh, with if you're using maize, like uh, is predominantly used in Germany, the potential is there to mix the to put the liquid into the tank, uh, the solid material into the tank, and mix it in there. We, we also have mechanical mixing in the digestion vessel. Originally, we were uh, looking at CHP uh, to generate elect- uh, electricity. There was a scheme there, Refit 3, wasn't very attractive, wasn't as attractive as the scheme in the north of Ireland, where they built 85 plants or thereabouts based on their uh, renewable obligation certificate scheme. Uh, at the initial stage, we had, it was 150 kilowatt uh, electricity output, which uh, is small in in uh, European uh, biogas uh, terms. The typical model would have been in Germany, 100, uh, uh, 500 kilowatts. And indeed, the plants have even got bigger as, as the market or the industry has moved towards biomethane. We were to use the heat in our bioscience building at Grange, but the opportunity has come to uh, to go the biomethane route, and that's the, 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 the route we are taking. There, that's the plant under construction. Two tanks, one is the digester and one is the digestate tank, because every day uh, you will put in some more material into the digester and you will take out uh, some material as uh, digestate. The, the digester is insulated and uh, 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 clad with uh, steel sheeting and gas is collected uh, overhead. That's the, uh, the, pre- or the, the, yeah, the pre-mixing system where the uh, forages are mixed with slurry um, before they are put into the digester, and that's the control. Um, the control, excuse me, the 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 the, the uh, pump station and control center for the uh, for the development. Just in terms of uh, feedstocks, and these are typical uh, feedstocks which we would be uh, uh, looking at to generate the gas. Uh, 9.3 tonnes a day of silage and 14.5 tonnes a day of slurry. And if we look at where the gas would come from, uh, although you have uh, a smaller proportion of uh, of silage, it produces you know a bigger proportion of the gas. And it's fairly obvious the, the slurry already, the material already has been digested by the, by the animal. And uh, so some of the potential energy is already removed. 
just in terms of this, the scale of uh, feedstock supply needed, that would be the silage from 70 hectares and the winter slurry from 1,000 cattle. So although our biogas plant would be considered small in European terms, in Irish farm size, it would not, it would be very large. In terms of feedstock supply, we looked at uh, or just an expression of interest in the in, in the local uh, paper. Uh, we looked for 60 hectares in total with a minimum parcel size of 10 hectares. 15 farms replied, but what was interesting was we were oversubscribed by a factor of 12, which would kind of indicate that that uh, study from SEAI would you know, indicate that there is there is forages, you know, that there, there is potential out there to produce um to produce uh, feedstocks for for other uses than than uh, than feeding to animals, uh, and just if we look at taking a typical plant within a ten kilometer radius, that harvest hinterland of ten kilometers has a total area of thirty one thousand four hundred, and the average agricultural area in Ireland is sixty six percent of total. Uh, grassland area is ninety two percent of ag area. So if we if we run down through the figures. We 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 have uh, 19,066 19, hectares of grass area. If we just capture ten percent of that, and then just go after the five tons per hectare per hectare uh, of the additional grass that can be grown, would provide a resource for ten grange plants. No reduction in milk per meat output. So there is a there is a huge scale of potential out there. Has to be mobilised. Has to be done sustainably. Has to be done economically. But the potential is there. And indeed, Joe McInerney undertook research here at Grange uh, back when we were just starting the journey. And if we went after all the land, all the potential that was out there in uh, underutilised land in Ireland, we could produce 44 terawatt hours uh, of uh, biogas or biomethane energy. And that's equivalent to four times the SEI estimate. Uh, and it's interesting that the, the Current target is five point seven terawatt hour target. So you know it's 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 challenging, but it's 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 potentially achievable. Just some research. Uh, Kira Bosang has started recently with us as a, a researcher on AD, and Kira was working as as a postdoc here and doing some work on the uh, sustainability of um, uh, biomethane and uh, looking at uh, different feedstocks. And just what's interesting here. Uh, you know, conventional perennial ryegrass with 120 uh, kilos per hectare of, of nitrogen. The other ones, red clover and perennial ryegrass are uh, uh, multi-species wards. Without nitrogen can grow, uh, you know, equi equivalent amounts of uh, feedstock, which in terms of sustainability is very important. Um, you have to conform to the Renewable Energy Directive. Producing the feedstocks has to be done in a way that is clearly uh, sustainable. And uh, the Directive provides uh, you know, uh, rules on, on the, the greenhouse gas emissions. And Kira has been looking at uh, what that means for uh, producing uh, forage feedstocks. Um, the minimum emissions savings required to be deemed renewable uh, on the heat side, 80%, and transport, 65%. You do get credit for manure as a feedstock, so that's uh, important to have in the mix. Uh, basically, uh, on the transport side, all production systems can can conform, and on on the heat side, we're challenged if we're using uh, grass and nitrogen. If you don't need nitrogen, you won't be need you won't be using it because obviously nitrogen costs money. So there's very interesting work going on on red clover, following on from work that Park Kiley and Dan Clavin did here on small scale plots. That's now being uh, widened out to a large scale animal production plots and well, pre are are producing forages for 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 ad feedstock. Uh, we have work. Uh, being undertaken by PhD student Sophia Tosako, and again uh, uh, modelling uh, the process of co-digestion of grass silage and animal slurry, trying to optimise the the, the, the the process. Uh, there's we there's a fleet project, a transport logistics modelling project being undertaken by Morris DC and Fiona Thorn, uh, and that's looking at. Uh, 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 accessing feedstocks in different areas of the country just to uh, show or to demonstrate where the best potential where the best potential is and our colleagues in Johnston Castle are working on um specific areas of ad optimization using slurry additives 
uh, optimizing AD by using different uh, uh, forage species and looking at the effects of digestive, digestive spreading on, on land in terms of fertilizer recovery. And just to uh, acknowledge the uh, support we have from the different agencies to carry out uh, this, this work. Uh, Tom mentioned national biomethane targets. Uh, just to put that into perspective, the current natural gas use in Ireland is 54 terawatt hours, and that's about 50% of that is used for electricity generation. Uh, the, the, the Irish target uh, recently announced is uh, 5.7 terawatt hours by 2030. And that's equivalent to 1,700 grain size plants. But as Tom mentioned, they're talking about 200, 250 plants. So, you know, it's larger scale plants. And the opportunity, I think, for farmers will be to become feedstock uh, suppliers. OK, there will be farmers who will uh, uh, invest in the technology. But uh, in the main, I, I think the opportunity will, will develop as uh, feedstock uh, suppliers. In terms of land area? That's 120,000 hectares. It's 3% of agricultural land. So if you look at it like that, it's not a huge amount of land. Some or all of that can be produced in those hidden hectares I talked about by uh, uh, having policy to uh, try to mobilize more grass or forage on uh, land that's currently uh, producing at less than its potential. It's the winter slurry for 1.3 million cattle and that could be a bigger challenge in the short term than the uh, than the uh, forage supply. And uh, in terms of what 5.7 terawatt hour uh, target means, it's about 10% of current gas use. And indeed, Europe has a target which is about 10% of, 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 of European gas use. So we're in line with that uh, target. Just in land use, these are some uh, uh, charts that uh, uh, colleague Kevin Hanrahan produced, not specifically by any means for uh, uh, talking about biomethane, but just it gives a general uh, historical uh, uh, picture of you know what we did with land, and this is for the main tillage crops going back to 1850. In 1850, we had 600,000 hectares of oats. And if you recall, it's 120,000 hectares of land we needed for the 10% the, the, the uh, target. Uh, and you can see uh, the amount uh, of the land uh, for oats dropping over the years. But why did we have oats? We had 600,000 horses in 1850. They were the engines. They were the energy source of the time. And... Uh, uh, as as uh, you can see, a, a drop off in oat area as we got better at growing oats. We had the same number of horses right up till after the Second World War, and then uh, take you know the uh, uh, conventional engines took over all uh, transport and uh, mechanical operations. So the amount of horses dropped. We only grow twenty five thousand hectares of oats now versus six hundred thousand. So just an interesting uh, uh, bit of data. We had a grass drying industry in Ireland, uh, a very substantial grass drying industry in Ireland to produce uh, protein concentrate feeds uh, for pigs and uh, poultry and also, also cattle. Uh, that relied on oil to dry the grass. Uh, that industry uh, basically uh, uh, went into decline as Soya bean became the, uh, the the protein concentrate of choice, and uh, uh, the last dryer of grass I think is finished twenty years ago. But you can see very substantial er uh, areas of grass uh, were being uh, uh, assembled at an industrial scale, uh, and that you know the figures are there for 19, 1972. And what's interesting, they're fairly well spread across the country. There was a couple in Mead, Offaly, Waterford. Galway, Mayo. So that industry was right across the, the, the country. And technology was way, way uh, at a lower scale than what than what we have now. So I think, you know, assembling the logistics of assembling, harvesting and assembling grasses, you know, uh, with that, that kind of 10 kilometer, 20 kilometer radius 
is 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 logistically mechanically uh, the equipment is there is there to do it uh just uh, to to talk a bit about uh, uh europe to total natural gas use in europe is uh 4200 terawatt hours and uh, they, there's a target of 35 billion cubic meters of that to be by a meeting by 2030 uh 35 that it, it, it equates to about 10 percent denmark very interesting country uh comparable to ourselves use a bit less gas than we do they are currently at 25 percent renewable gas uh and uh they aim to have 75 percent by 2025 and 100 percent by 2030 that process didn't happen overnight this is uh, uh just a, a, a an excerpt from um a, an environmental impact conference in Chagas in 1991. And that's, you know, it's over 30 years ago, but there was a small scale uh, AD plant uh, in Loch Sheelan, uh, a, a research plant uh, been monitored by, by Olus. They had problems with surplus pig slurry in the area. And um, Tiger Flaherty's summary from that report was that the best solution to handle the, 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 slurry, the slurry surplus in the Loch Sheelan area uh, was to establish a full-scale central treatment plant along the lines of the plant at Lintorp in Denmark. And, uh, you know, look where Denmark are now. So uh, Ireland are only at the start of the journey, uh, but, you know, if we can follow the model that uh, that Denmark uh, 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 have done, uh, those, those targets are achievable. And, you know, I just go back to the hidden hectares because, you know, there's a, this... Fear maybe that uh, 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 we will we will uh, impact on our uh, uh, ability to produce forages for animals. Um, the, the 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 hidden hectares are there as a potential resource. Uh, nationally, they could serve as two thousand two hundred and forty plants the size of Grange. Now, uh, as as we know, the, the 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 plants will be bigger, but the scale is there to get forages from those those hidden hectares and. 20, if, uh, uh, ten percent of hidden hectares will provide five percent of total energy. Twenty percent, ten likewise, will be ten percent of energy. Thirty percent would provide fifteen percent of energy demand. So there, there is a large resource out there. Of course, the other potential opportunity is if we do have to reduce animal numbers uh, because of greenhouse gas emissions, production of forages is a Relatively, e production of forages for uh, for AD is a relatively easy uh, practical solution for farmers uh, to use their land. They, they, you know, they they know how to grow the crops. They know how to harvest them. Uh, it's it's not a, a a whole new education job that's that's needed, or indeed a commitment to uh, crops. Uh, we say forestry uh, commitment to, to, to forestry uh, has been. We'll say not the, the numbers haven't been as successful as uh, we probably thought they would be. Whereas it's it would be a much easier uh, uh, adoption uh, of or reuse of land to use it uh, for for uh, for forage crops ready. That's the Grange plant. Uh, just ready. We're almost ready to go. We got some delay in the supply of our upgrader. Most of the technology on site. So by the middle of the year, we will be uh, producing uh, biogas, uh, cleaning up the biogas to biomethane, and also utilizing the the CO two. So thank you. Uh, thanks very much, JJ. Very um, interesting presentation. Um, and I, I, I was quite um, interested to see the, the, the small history lesson uh, built into your presentation. And, I, and for me, I suppose it, 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 it point, points out that um, uh, our farming systems change over time. So this could be a change that maybe in 20 or 30 or 40 years time, we look back and say, oh, yeah, we used to do that, but now we're doing a lot of it. So Quite interesting, but but on that, just I, I I'll just ask um, one one question, um, uh, kind of related to that, um, and it came in on the chat there from from Catherine in relation to the hidden hectares, and, and and you did clarify it a little bit towards the end of your presentation. 
But I suppose one of the things that's, that struck me, um, if, if you have your anaerobic digestion plant in, a, in an area surrounded by hidden hectares, let's just say, it would strike me that you won't have the slurry, okay, that the animals won't be there. Uh, whereas if you try to locate the plant in an area where there are a lot of animals currently, there won't be as many hidden hectares. So do you see the... the, the Yes, uh, in terms of logistics, Tom, yeah, uh, obviously the ideal location will be in an area where you have both feeds are close by. And I think there are low hanging fruit for the for the initial targets. Uh, there's a lot of very large scale beef finishing feedlots in the country where there's cattle in all year round. And they tend to be in areas, uh, you know, where there's substantial grass production. Uh, it's easier to move. Uh, logistically to move the grass the distance because there's more energy in it. Uh, in terms of slurry movement, there would be uh, research uh, uh, going on uh, and in pre-processing the slurry, dewatering it before you might you before you would transport it. So I think they're all things that can happen as the industry develops. Uh, the mushroom industry developed in Monaghan, and there was large scale movement of straw, you know, up the, you know, up from the, from the, uh, there was no, no, not much tillage in, in, in Monaghan, and the, 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 the straw uh, was all moved up there to produce compost. And I think, you know, the logistics, uh, the logistical problem will be solved uh, once the, once the, the, the industry is economic. Okay, and I, I'm just going to ask one other question linked to that because it also came in in the chat from uh, Keen. Um, in relation to the hidden hectares that you refer to, currently uh, farmed at a low level of intensity um, as per your description in the presentation and the potential to produce more grass. Those areas that are farmed less intensively, I suppose, are probably more valuable for biodiversity um, currently. And if we move to farming them more intensively, there could be a, an unintended consequence of perhaps a, a, a negative impact on biodiversity on some of those areas. Would you care yeah. to comment? Yes, it's important to look after uh, biodiversity and that will be uh, and is part of uh, research that uh, uh, we would be uh, uh, undertaking. But if you look at the, we only need 3% of agricultural land to produce all the feedstock in the country. So relative to our total land base, uh, what you know, what's needed uh, is is relatively small, and uh, I, I think the industry uh, acknowledges that it has to do this sustainably. So uh, the RGFI have uh, um, uh, undertaken uh, some uh, studies to show that uh, you know the 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 the, the land is there and uh, the percentage of land that you're using uh, is managed in a way that, uh, you know, we won't be impacting negatively on, on biodiversity. Okay, okay. Um, Barry, I'll hand over to you now. You, you There's a lot of questions in on the chat. Um, people are obviously yeah. very interested in the topic. Uh, yeah. you, you might um, pose some of those questions to JJ now. Yeah, uh, a lot of interest, especially I suppose this is on the environmental theme as well, Tom, and a lot mm. of queries in the whole area of sustainability and sustainability criteria. And I know they came in from Mary and George and, and Kane is Keynes is linked to that as well, that question, but is what kind of sustainability criteria is there to ensure that AD biogas plants won't lead to further environmental issues or challenges? Uh, that's the general theme of what's coming in mm. on the sustainability stuff there, JJ. Mm. Yeah, well, I, 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 I did mention some of the work that uh, Kira uh, Bosang is undertaking in Grange with the Renewable Energy Directive and uh, for uh, your gas to, conf to, to comply as a renewable gas, you have to follow those uh, 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 targets. Now, th those targets, I think, originally are focused on using uh, wheat for bioethanol and uh, uh, maize. Uh, for 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 energy and uh, grass has to conform as well. But the fact that we can you know use a crop like red clover to produce our forage and produce twelve tons of dry matter per hectare uh, without any nitrogen, you know, allows a very interesting. Uh, uh, when you do the studies, you know, you, 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 you get very interesting results in terms of sustainability. Red clover is a bit more challenging. 
uh, multi-cut uh, system. But red clover is used by the by organic farms. Red clover was a very important crop fifty years ago, before nitrogen became uh, before before artificial nitrogen was available and was cheap. Red clover was what you used to to, uh, to produce nitrogen, red and white clover. Uh, JJ, sorry, could I just interrupt? Would you mind um, um, stop sharing your screen and um, Barry, you, right. you can continue down with the with the questions. Yeah. I just think on that point as well on the sustainability criteria, just to point it out as well that for biomethane gas from AD plants, if they're to be classified as a zero carbon renewable fuel, the plants have to be able to achieve strict sustainability criteria. And that's outlined within what's called the EU Renewable Energy Directive. So it's red mm -hmm. two, and the future one that's coming is red three. So it's important that people are aware of that, that red two and red three, this renewable energy directive two and three that's coming fairly soon. That's stipulating strict controls in relation to biomass fuels that are used to produce, um, you know, uh, renewable energy. And mm. some of those things will be in the likes of the land that was formerly peatland. You can't use, uh, you can't derive the, the material from that type of land that was formerly mm. peatland. Uh, land that would be high biodiversity value that cannot be used either. So mm. um, there will be strict criteria and also land with high carbon stock that would mm. be eliminated. So, you know, capturing the methane from the slurry, that reduces very significantly the amount that's been released to the atmosphere as well. So that's a very positive for the environment. Uh, so it's uh, it's been carbon negative and it's improving the overall greenhouse gas savings of the AD facility as well. Uh, JJ, there's a, a question coming in there in relation to uh, the type of supports that are available. Is there any supports there at the moment that's making biomethane happen? Or are there planned supports? Uh, we, we, ha we haven't had a good history uh, in terms of supporting biogas uh, uh, yet in the country. The, the, the uh, reefer tree scheme, you know, there's a couple of biogas plants uh, got up and running, but their business model was to have uh, a feedstock with a gate fee, a waste feedstock that came to the plant with a gate fee. And by all means, they're important plants and uh, they're doing a job uh, managing uh, uh, organic wastes. Uh, other countries have been have have come in to support the, the industry. And I think that's part of what's happening at the moment. There, there is work going on uh, to uh, develop uh, the final policy, which will include incentives uh, that will allow us to get the uh, the targets. Two types of incentive, a capital in, because the buildings, because the equipment and the technology uh, is, is expensive. So uh, that is uh, one element uh, to have uh, 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 aid for, for capital uh, investment, but also aid for, um, you know, the, the, the amount of gas produced. If there's aid for the amount of gas produced, there's a continuous incentive to keep your, 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 your plant running. But I think what is interesting, customers are looking for biomethane across Europe and, uh, you know, they, they, you can source gas through the gas grid. We, we import gas through the grid, but we can also export gas. It won't be the actual molecules of gas, but it would be on a certificate system whereby if somebody puts a, a renewable gas into the grid in any part of Europe, uh, a customer in a different part of Europe can, can can utilize that. So there's interesting things happening, and I think the policy policy makers, you know, will will uh, finally uh, crystallize, you know, incentives uh, that can can allow plants to to to, to go ahead. The targets are there. Sorry, Barry. And I think that the the the, the kind of the policy mechanism, because there's a good few queries about that, is what sort of support mechanism will, will be there. And I hear the renewable heat obligation that that should be up and running next year do you feel that's going to be a, a good support mechanism for the for the industry well it, it it it'll be a start i mean you know if there's a if there's uh, something guaranteed uh it has to be at a level that you know makes things uh, economic if things are not economic for for you know uh if, if the economic model doesn't work the practical systems won't be put in place yeah, just and to explain, explain that to the listeners there that, uh, you know, the renewable heat obligation is going to require the fuel suppliers in the heat sector to ensure that a percentage of the fuel that, the, that they supply, that it comes from renewable sources. So biomethane will likely be used to help meet the obligations for the natural gas customers in the country. 
So mm. that that's sorry, Tom, you were going to say something there. Yeah, I was just going to come in there because I'm just looking at the questions as well and talk of incentives. There's a number of questions in relation to the the incentive to the farmer to supply the grass or supply the feedstock. I, I suppose you you know the previous answer was was relating to the, the the incentive to the operator of the the plant, I guess, to establish the plant. So JJ, the, one or two questions in there on um, on the questions and answers in relation to when you looked for the supply of grass for the plant in Grange, you know what what type of level of um, remuneration was ordered was offered to the farmers. Uh we we would we would buy silage directly for use with cattle over the years and uh the figure uh things have changed in the last year would increase fuel costs and increased harvesting costs we didn't actually have that was an expression of interest uh we didn't we didn't put a figure on it at that stage but it will be critical i mean you know farmers won't produce silage for bio biogas plants to run a, to for the farm to run at a loss so mm. uh i think there are some interesting things. Har uh, harvesting silage is a big cost, but if you're running uh, a biogas plant uh, and using silage, you will have, I would say, at least four cuts of silage a year. Uh, that's not typical of what we ask the contractors to do at the moment. Everybody wants the contractor, <coughs> you know, two weeks in in middle of May to the middle, you know, the end of end of May, first week in June, and then they have nothing to do. Whereas if the if the work is uh, more balanced, you know the, the the cost can reduce. Now look at silage silage harvesting costs have gone up, uh, and that's mm. a reflection on uh, fuel costs. But mm. um, I think fuel costs, you know, will trend downwards if uh, the problems in the in the Ukraine are sorted out, and uh, um, that type of you know a guaranteed level of work over a longer period. Uh, will also uh, should also uh, impact on uh, the, the level of cost. Um, mm -hmm. It look at the plants will have the the the, the feedstock producers have to get uh, will have to get remunerated because they don't produce feedstock the plants can't operate. So I think there's a you know there's there, there's a, a balance there a balance there. Will will the um, will there be a payment to the farmers for the supply of slurry also or you know are they, are they just I'll use the term loaning the slurry to the to the uh, anaerobic digester and it comes back as a, a valuable product the, the yeah. digestate. Um, I, I, I think in the short term, you know, probably the real advantage of a of a bio methane plant in an area would be to deal with surplus slurries. You know, farmers who are uh, operating, we'll say a nitrate derogation, if if a biogas plant uh, could manage that material would mean that that farmer had to have less storage on the farm would mean that the the the, the nutrients were were sent to a deficit area after the biomethane uh, after the the digestion process uh it could be very interesting that it it might be actually a service that people would be willing to pay for right okay you hadn't thought that there's, there's a good few queries coming in here about um you know the feed socks that would be required by a typical biomethane plant um, so obviously the Grange plant would be, wouldn't be your typical biomethane plant, but um, do you want to go through maybe some of the figures what will be needed and how much land would be required in the country to meet that? Yeah, well, 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 like the Grange plant would be the silage from the typical silage uh, production from 70 hectares and the slurry from upwards to a thousand cattle. And it just multi it's just multiplied up. If you build a plant uh, 10 times that size, it's uh, 700 hectares and, uh, you know, 10,000 cattle. So I, I did say that the slurry will be the big, the bigger challenge. And like the slurry is important because of the sustainability. But, uh, you know, increasing the use of clover uh, helps you get get, get, get there. And, um, I, you know, look at we're not starting an industry in Ireland that's not well developed in a lot of other countries in Europe. And we're probably in a nice position where we can cherry pick the good parts and, you know, ensure that whatever we do uh, uh, is done, you know, in the best possible, you know, in the best possible manner. I see that uh, like a tw the, the last GNI report looked as, uh, you know, a 20 gigawatt hour biomethane plant that would require in the region around 37,000 tonne of feedstock. That'd be about 60% of that will be crops and 40% of that will be animal slurry. 
So yes. you can't you can't put in fully a uh, hundred percent grass for the sustainability criteria as per the Reg Two directive. So it's going to be around four hundred to five hundred hectares of land would be required for your typical uh, uh, twenty gigawatt hour plant. I think some of these plants maybe double that. You might see forty gigawatt hour plants, and again that will have a, a larger requirement. But a, a twenty gigawatt hour plant, based on that report, is required around four percent of the feedstock from the land within a 10 kilometer radius around it. So I think it will be somewhere between 100, or sorry, between 200 and 260 biogas plants that will have a that 20 gigawatt hour capacity. And I think the figure JJ was 120,000 hectares that will be needed uh, for grass silage to meet this 5.7 terawatt hour target mm -hmm. by, 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 20, uh, by, by, by 2030. Uh, there's, there's a query in there, am I allowed to take slurry from a neighboring farm or is a waste license needed? Mm. Okay, uh, with the, the, the there's a, a, a licensing scheme that you have to conform to the Department of Agriculture. And uh, once you get into multiple farm supplying, you have to pasteurize the, the material. We don't have to pasteurize because we are just producing the slurry ourselves. The larger plants will will pasteurize and be able to take slurry from uh, multiple multiple um, uh, sources. Yeah, I think it's important to say as well about the animal byproducts regulations uh, that they're classifying livestock waste such as cattle slurry and manure that they're class two animal byproducts. Uh, so the use of feedstocks such as that in a biogas plant is subject to lots of different constraints like thermal treatment, um, size reduction, um, and there's a lot of capital investment that's needed. So there's a lot of, uh, and the Department of Agriculture are involved in that process as well. Uh, and I think that the only exception there is for you're taking in small volumes of slurry from a single farmer, uh, and it has to be less than 5,000 tons of fresh material per year that's processed on farm in the biogas plant, and then it doesn't have to conform to the animal byproducts conditions. But um, a lot of questions there as well about digestate. Will it, will it be safe to put digestate back onto agricultural land from the proposed biomethane plants? And uh, how much digestate will be generated? Mm. I, I think that's a very interesting area. And particularly with the, high, the increasing costs in fertilizer and the sustainability required in production of fertilizer, digestate can be turned into uh, a fertilizer product that should be on par with uh, conventional fertilizers. And I think uh, that's the way uh, look, there, are, there, there are developments in Europe happening, uh, you know, in that space. And it's an area that we will, will, will be looking at, uh, at also that uh, you have in, you have NP and K available. The biogas process does not remove any of those nutrients. So they're all potentially available. The simplest way will be to uh, spread them as a liquid uh, material as through a, a trailing shoe or, or dribble bar, but you also have the potential to uh, to uh, uh, process and segregate out nutrients out of that material. So I think that will be a very interesting space over the next five or 10, 10 years. I think the use of clover is very interesting as well. And this, look at... Clover, you know, has been a, a crop that's uh, that that uh, probably lost uh, uh, lost uh, its uh, people lost interest in it as uh, you know nitrogen was the reliable and cheap way to grow grass. But uh, as I said, the organic people always had clover, and and it's becoming much more uh, important again. The, the work from Dan Clavin and Parker Kiley, you know, shows that you can grow. Crops of you know uh, your twelve tons of dry matter per hectare with no nitrogen. Uh, so in a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a feedstock for a biogas plant, you actually uh, potentially you know are operating that uh, you, you you don't need any of the nitrogen to go back out onto your feedstock land, and the nitrogen that's in there from the animal slurries uh, can basically be be segregated and used uh, you know in deficit areas. So I think you know. All takes money and uh, technology. In the past, fertilizer was cheap, and there wasn't as uh, uh, such concern for environmental sustainability. So these things weren't managed uh, in a way that optimized the, the utilization. But I think you know we're we're in a we're in a a, 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 a space now where you will find that uh, those those type of technologies will will, will have a place. 
Yeah, and I think that's an important point JG made there about the management as well. And <clears throat> I think that the management of the digestate is going to be so important. You know, it's going to be a key aspect of any new AD plant that's going to be developed. You know, that'll be establishing a nutrient management plan together with the farmers in the vicinity because, you know, it will require a lot of spread land, but it will be a valuable nutrient for those farmers, as you mentioned, in the absence, you know, in, in, in an era of high fertilizer prices. You know, you're you're taking this material, which is a, a nitrogen value of maybe 3.6 kilograms per fresh ton. Maybe there's a there's a there's a phosphorus content, there's a, a potassium content in it as well. So it does have a very high value, and of course it's in the ammonia form as well, which is more available to the growing plant. But there's there will be a requirement, of course, to use your trailing shoe or direct injection. You wouldn't be able to use splash plate, or otherwise you're creating other environmental issues uh, associated with it. Mm. Um, question I that comes to mind for me, um, um, JJ, is is the return of the digest the digestate to the farmer? Um, will, will the farmer require a, a separate storage tank for that on its return to the farm? Because it may not be possible to land spread that at all times of the year. Yeah, look at what's interesting is that 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 whole um, uh, pathway and movement of material. Uh, in, in, in our case here, uh, we, we actually operate under nitrate irrigation on the farm here in Grange uh, because of the, 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 the type of uh, stocking rates we have. And uh, we deal with uh, a number of local farmers uh, over the years. Now that we're looking at the, the digestate uh, availability and, uh, you know, which, which will be a higher grade uh, fertilizer source, uh, we have uh, people talking about perhaps maybe uh, a, a tillage farmer constructing a store on their farm to allow uh, material to be transferred for, readily, for to be readily available for spreading. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not too worried about the, you know those th those problems. I, I I think you know if you look at what's happened in other countries in Europe, that in Denmark uh, centralized storage was one of the the key drivers. Or, or, or it, it, it it allowed uh, the economics to 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 to, uh, uh, to be attractive that uh, the, the the AD plant was providing the storage, so the farmers didn't didn't have to provide so much storage you know on the farm. So I think we have to look at this slightly different maybe than the strict rules that are there at the moment. If you were starting off a farm. Uh, on a greenfield site now that that uh, was going to send their slurry to a digestate plant, you know, you probably don't need to, you, 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 you practically you don't need the storage on the farm, you know, let let, let the storage be provided at scale. So, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I think, you know, things will develop. Uh, look, we have to start. The industry has to start before these these become any sort of uh, problems. Tom, I think. Question, yeah, question. Uh, there in relation. Question to... that, another question is in the chat. There is in relation to you know you've mentioned Denmark quite a bit in your in your presentation and answer to questions, JJ. But um, a significant anaerobic digestion industry has developed in Northern Ireland over a short period of time. Um, are, are there lessons to learn from Northern Ireland? Um, and I, I think the question specifically refers to you know our. Are we engaging with colleagues in Northern Ireland to find out, you know, what, what are the, 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 the maybe the, the ways to do this and, and what are the mistakes to avoid? We, look, at, we, we would be uh, uh, in regular contact with uh, uh, the, the, the people in Hillsborough who have, are running a, a biogas plant up there for a number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of lessons we can learn, um, Look at if a biogas plant is built in an area, there's an additional uh, demand on feedstocks, which pushes prices up. And, you know, that may feel, you know, there may be certain negativity uh, uh, coming from, you know, from looking at that way. But if the biogas plant is producing a, a, a solution for a surplus nutrient, slurry, slurry nutrient problem, uh, there's a benefit to have the biogas plant in the area. Look at some feedstocks for the AD plants in North of Ireland are being produced as you know, very close here to Grange. Maize went to the North of Ireland. Yeah, I'd suggest that you know the industry would need to look at that. That's probably not the 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 the, the best way to uh, to uh, provide to, to provide feedstocks. Question there, JJ, in relation to poultry manure. Of course, we have a, a number of broiler producers across the country there. Can broiler litter be used 
uh, especially yeah, this I mean, areas where it cannot be used. Yeah, for a challenge with high nitrogen. Uh, I know there are plants. We have no experience here uh, working with poultry uh, manure, on, you know, on a lab scale even. But um, uh, you know. It, it, there are plants running with poultry manure, but it, it, there are additional challenges. There are additional challenges. You know, you have to get the the the, the nitrogen carbon balance right in there, and uh, it may mean that you use you know other feedstocks to balance out the the the, the material. Yeah. Question, dear. Do you think the weather in Ireland is good to produce biogas? Um, it's good to produce grass. So grass is the feedstock. Uh, you know, we have. Like the last couple of weeks haven't been great for grass, but then February was a great month. So I think, uh, like in term in European terms, Ireland can produce the the highest uh, dry matter, uh, tons of dry matter per hectare on grassland. So you know, uh, grassland will, will I think is the crop of choice for for AD feedstocks, and pr probably for uh, clover will be very important and. Uh, the, the multi-species swords with the with the, the results that are coming back from there. They offer additional challenges for making silage. Uh, the multi-species swords would offer additional challenges for, for wilting. Clover, probably not as uh, a challenging, but a little bit maybe more challenging than, than grass. But I think, you know, we, we, we can get there. We can get there. Yeah, lots of queries Barry, come in. Uh, fi fi final question for you, Barry, because we're, we're up against our time. Yeah, we're tight. No, go ahead, Barry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, look, at there's loads of questions. We won't yeah. get them. A lot of them around the whole area of the uh, the new, new nutrient uh, issues and the, you know, all the digestive that will be produced. And um, I think we've covered that in relation to the nutrient manage management plans. Final question. Is there more potential to use barley straw rather than grass silage as the biogas potential of straw is multiple that of grass? The bio, look, it's not something that we've worked on. Biogas potential of straw, pre-processing of straw needed to make it work. And look, at we don't have that much straw in the country. You know, we have a much bigger potential with grass. So, like, we'll be open to all uh, opportunities. But, uh, you know, uh, definitely in terms of, you know, the studies have shown that, you know, grass is the, is, 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 is the, uh, is, is, is the feedstock for Ireland. Okay, and just one final question from EJJ um, uh, in relation to the supply of slurry. Is there a year-round supply of slurry needed as a feedstock? Yes, the, 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 the short answer is yes, but we'd say for the Grange plant, uh, we would uh, be aiming to run uh, it on lower slurry during the summer uh, and higher slurry during the winter. Okay. Uh, but you know you need you need you need slurry all year round, and that's look at potentially the low hanging fruit is cattle feed beef feedlots, uh, piggeries. That's the low hanging fruit uh, uh, where, where where the industry should should target. And just to kind of put it in perspective, there, Tom, the the winter slurry based on the five point seven terawatt hour target, the winter slurry from one point three million cattle is going to be needed, and that represents about twenty percent of all cattle slurry produced in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So it's quite, quite a bit to be gathered up. Yeah, yeah and, I did say and, that's that's the bigger, that, that could be the bigger challenge in the short term. Yeah, and, and the logistical challenge of transporting it. But I guess that's all a, a manageable problem if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the economics of the system stacks up, you know, people will make it happen or solutions will be found, I guess, you know. So the, that's probably the important piece to get right. Okay, look, uh, as Barry has already said, there was there, there was a lot of questions in the chat. We've gone through as many of them as our time has allowed, um, um, but, but others we won't be able to get to, given that we, we have to try and wrap this up. It, it's, it's now half 10. Um, so uh, thank you very much, JJ, uh, and also to Barry, uh, for your, uh, for, uh, for, to JJ for your presentation and your answers, and also to Barry for uh, asking the questions. Um, <clears throat> next Friday, uh, we're, there's going to be a short break in the Signpost series webinars, uh, as it's Good Friday. Uh, we will return with our next episode of the Signpost series webinar on Friday, the 14th of April at 9.30 a.m. Uh, and on that morning, we'll, um, we'll be joined by Jeremy Cutchin, a specialist pig development officer with Chagas. 
uh, who will uh, share uh, his knowledge around the Irish pig sector and the environment uh, on that morning. So that's on the next webinar is on Friday, the 14th of April, no Sanko series webinar next Friday morning. Uh, so all that's left for me to do now at this stage is thank you very much uh, all for joining us this morning. Uh, hope you have a great weekend and uh, wish you a happy Easter. And finally then to thank our production team this morning of Yvonne Marr and Andy Boland. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.